to check and make sure everything's working. Hmm. Funny, it's not really coming together for me. Oh, this is really silly. Um, I think that I accidentally didn't start the stream. <laughs> Alright, but here we are. Okay, hope everybody can see me. Sorry for any delay. I clicked start, and YouTube was like, you're good to go. And then it was like, oh, your bitrate's not very good. So I got derailed a little bit. So I was talking to myself, which is actually somehow appropriate for the 420 celebration of the Italian opening. So anyway, I guess I'll start back off where, where I was talking to myself about. So um, we're celebrating this uh, Italian opening, which was started basically 420 years ago by a guy named Joachino Greco. Hello, Shai. Welcome. Um, sorry about the delay. I, don't, I really don't know what happened there. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so this guy, Joachino Greco, born in the year 1600, approximately. People didn't record things very well back then, so we don't know. Um, he was kind of the head honcho in terms of developing this chess opening that we call the Italian in modern times. In fact, it's called the Italian because he was an Italian guy who, you know, pioneered this whole thing. So it became famous as the development that came from Italy because of him. Um, it's actually kind of ironic that it's called the Italian and his name is Greco because Greco means Greek in Italian, but he's not Greek, he's Italian. So anyway, um, this is a funny thing. So yeah, he was born like 1600, and he published a book or something in which he showed all of his chess games that he thought were really cool and important, and they're all Greco versus no name. He took out the names of his opponents because I guess at that time, <coughs> people considered it kind of embarrassing to lose a chess game. Beats me. Anyway, so the identity of all of his opponents is secret, but he published um, his games, and they're basically, I think there are, there are very few recorded losses by Greco. That's probably because of uh, confirmation bias, though. He probably just didn't uh, publish his losses. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk about just one opening that he played that, is, that he's famous for, which is this one, the Italian. And last night I, I got a question from, from somebody who said, why, why do grandmasters favor the Italian opening? And this is a little bit of a double-edged question because, you know, modern chess has, is very, very different from um, the chess that they played like 400 years ago. 400 years ago, the, the modern rules of chess had just solidified, so people were still kind of learning how to how to deal with the rules and trying to discover things on their own. They had no computers. Um, but a lot of the things that they did back then have kind of grown and grown and grown to become the modern chess theory. And the Italian opening has stood the test of time. People still play it, like Carlson plays it, but they play it differently. And understanding why they play it differently requires analysis of the, the old way that people played it and why they stopped. So um, <clears throat> another interesting thing about studying the old games is that at lower rating levels, things that are very old are still relevant. So um, some people say, oh, I don't want to play that opening. It's refuted. But if your opponents can't refute it, you should play it. So a lot of the things that I'm going to show today are going to be very, very um, useful and hopefully instructive for people who are in a rating range that's around like 1500 or below. Even if you like study v very well, you can play some of these things that Greco did 400 years ago up to the 2000 level. So anyway, um, so this is the main discussion point. And we're going to see a couple of sidelines that are not from this position, but this is the main uh, discussion point here. So um, this is the Italian after black plays bishop c5. That's what we call it. This collection of moves for white and black, that's the Italian. And it's it's a classic beginner opening in the sense that white's controlling the center a lot in their first three moves. Black is controlling the center a lot as well in their first three moves. So both sides are fighting for center control. And that's and they're fighting for it directly. They're not doing any weird hyper modern stuff where they like the Enkedo the Bishop to control it from far away late in the game. It's just direct control. I'm attacking the center, you have to fight me for it. So this kind of makes sense that this would be the first thing that people tried like 420 years ago um, because it's the most direct approach. Usually people don't try 
usually people start with what's simplest and then they develop from there. And it's actually pretty challenging to find a problem with this very direct approach, which is why it's valid at a low level. <laughs> Greco was only rated 1600. Yeah, he had one point for every year AD since he was um, since he was born. No, just kidding. He, he, was, he was born in the year 1600 approximately. And in his book, um, I think all of his games were dated in 1620. So if you check Mega Database from Chess Base, or if you check the free stuff on chessgames.com or lightchess.org, if you search for Greco, um, you'll find pretty much all of his games happened in one year. That's probably not accurate. He was born around 1600. He died at the age of 35. Um, but he probably played chess for several years in there. It's just that we don't know exactly when each game was played. And we also don't know any of his opponents. But it's pretty clear from the analysis of his games that he was relatively strong. Um, but between like 1600 and 1800, a lot of the um, strongest players or most famous players were actually not that good by modern standards because everything that the, that the old players do, it builds up and it leads to improvements that people can do now. So it's kind of like how even if you're not extremely, even if you're not a math genius, you can benefit from the mathematical tools that have been developed by great, great uh, mathematicians from the last hundred years, like calculus. You don't, you don't have to invent, reinvent the wheel. They've done the work for you. So anyway, this is our discussion point. And it, one of the, one of the reasons that um, people recommend beginners to play this opening is it's, it's very logically simple, right? Just control the center with your pieces, do it fast, and you also get to castle your king quickly. Now, in my experience, people basically never listen to me. I'm like, castle your king, and they're like, oh, but I don't want to castle, and then they get checkmated in the middle of the board. And then they're like, oh, why did I lose? And I'm like, well, it's because you didn't castle. But anyway, in the Italian, at least you have the choice to castle very quickly. It's the fastest way to castle with white. You can castle in four moves here. It's up to you whether or not you want to castle after that, but you have options here. So we're going to start with um, actually something that's not the Italian game, just one of Greco's games. Um, in the early days, people were trying out all kinds of weird stuff, and chess was like a very macho game. That might be actually why um, his opponent's names are not listed in any database. They might have not wanted to be um, acknowledged in these games that they lost. And I think Greco hardly reported any games where, where he lost. So there's a little bit of a, a bias here in, re in the reporting. So back in the day, people would play this queen f6, and if you are rated around like 1100, you might still see this. Um, a lot of people know a famous game that happened about like a hundred, mm, like two hundred fifty years later, approximately, um, called the Opera Game. The Opera Game went with Knight C3, which we will not be seeing today. Um, Paul Morphy had White against. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, sa I'm saying Opera Game. I meant Morphy versus McConnell. Morphy versus McConnell was like almost in the same year. Um, so after Knight C3. Um, McConnell played c6, and I'll just give you guys like a sneak peek. You can check this out. I think I've probably already talked about this game. And Morphy played d4, and it became a big attacking game after he sacked a pawn like this. But this was way later. Um, I'm not sure if Morphy had access to Greco's analysis, but it would not be totally unreasonable to suppose that he did. But information spread much more, uh, with much less ease than it does now, back then, because there was no internet. And even like transoceanic travel was restricted. But anyway, so Greco, in the year around like 1620 or so, played bishop c4. And part of why I started with this is because if you're thinking about just white's moves, this is basically like white is adhering to their Italian game logic, right? We're attacking a weak spot in the center. We're attacking the center with a pawn. We fixed this pawn on e5, and we're attacking that pawn with the knight. It's a, it's a cohesive uh, setup. Um, the only thing that's weird about it is that black played queen f6. Like, what what are you doing, right? Definitely some 420 chess here. So, um, the next move that black played is also, like, really strange. It's queen g6. Uh, the similarity to the game Morphe versus McConnell is that the queen ended up taking this maneuver anyway and trying to go all in for, for something like this. Um, and that went really poorly under different circumstances. This is probably the fastest possible way that black could arrange this position, right? It just directly went here. So I guess it kind of makes sense. In the early days, people were thinking very tactically. The chess strategy hadn't developed that much. Um, it was very simple. And so some people were probably thinking, there's probably like a, a direct tactical reputation for my opponent's opening play. They didn't have any intuition for like moving the queen multiple times is not good. So 
Um, these early games kind of laid the groundwork for us, giving the beginner advice like don't move your queen too early unless you get free pieces or something. Anyway, so let's see what happened. Um, Greco did not give up the g-pawn the way that Morphe did, he just went here. But this gives up the e-pawn, so y you might be kind of wondering like, why would I give up the e-pawn? That's my pawn, I don't want to lose it. But sometimes you have to give a little to get a little. So in this game they, they took the pawn, greedy guts that they are. You know, they did this so far with the queen. This long maneuver. Meanwhile, all these guys are just like chilling, right? They're just vibing, not doing anything. Not great. Um, and here, there's already like multiple tactical opportunities. I think one is stronger than the rest, though. So if you're watching the replay, or, or you just want to like challenge yourself if you're in the chat right now, you feel free to post what you think the move is. It's white to play and get an outstanding position. I wouldn't say it, it wins material on the spot. It just gives you a very nice game. It's the kind of move where when you see it, you know it should be played. And here's a hint, right? So we developed this bishop. This is one of our main assets in the position. We have a bishop out. They don't have any bishops out. Um, this is actually an asset for us. The queen is misplaced. It's centrally located, but it's so early in the game that it can only get attacked there. Yeah, shy has got it. Bishop takes f7. So this combines these two factors that I just mentioned. If the king takes it, then knight g5 is a fork. Um, that's not how knights move. That's not how knights move. There we go. And the king's blushing because he's going to lose his queen. Sucks to suck. So, he can't take it. So he played king e7, which is pretty pathetic, honestly. And the the drums of war are beating after rook e1. See how all white's pieces are just flying in harmoniously? This is very easy for starting players to play. Even if you have no strategic nuance or, or thought whatsoever, this is an easy way to get the game rolling. So here they sacrificed their bishop yet again. Can you believe it? Really makes you wonder, what's wrong with taking this bishop? What is up with that? They probably should have just taken the bishop, right? But at the same time, they will have to reckon with their poor king safety after like d4. Here's another common tactical trick, right? We play d4, the bishop's attacking the queen, and where is the queen going? Why are you running? They probably have to go, like, here. But the fun just never ends after knight g5. The queen is actually hanging. So they would have to go maybe, like, back here. But this looks just pathetic. Knight g5. I meant to put the king there. And... Hold on, maybe not knight g5. I'm just looking for the, the finale here. There should be one. Probably this is good enough, because if they go here, we take it, with the queen, probably. Um, if they go here, we've got discover tack bill from the bishop. That's lethal. At this point, you don't really need to calculate. Like It's clear that their king is not coming back. Everything's going in our favor. Um, so you can just play such moves like by hand. And here, there's also some discover attack aroni going on. So it's clear that some, there's going to be a win somehow. But anyway, black was a total chicken and basically committed seppuku, or harakiri, depends on your taste. And they played king d8, and now it's like easy dubs mate in one. So if mate in one's something you want to find, you can pause the video, but I'm just going to tell you it's rook e8. Yep, too bad. So sad. Funny finish. Just an eight move game. A lot of these early historical games in the Italian are, are miniatures, so they make their way into miniature books sometimes. They're pretty fun. And because they're miniatures, they're easy to remember, and they're practical to know when you're a beginning player. So it's good to check out Greco's games, even though it was like 400 years ago. Modern Grandmaster games are like practically inscrutable, honestly. We can learn a lot from them, but it's a lot more difficult than understanding these old games. So um, we're just going to go down the line here. So in this next game, um, they actually went into the Italian. That last one was kind of a teaser. They played queen f6 and got wrecked. Uh, but here they've actually done the Italian thing. Taking a page, uh, what's the phrase that they say? Taking a page out of the master's book, right? So they're, they're doing what he's doing. And I think a lot of starting players are anxious when they, they see this copying thing. They're like, oh no, I'm copying, but actually it's, it's an asymmetry. It, it's not truly copying. Like, 
the, the knights are symmetrically fighting for the center, right? Um, but one is present on the queen side, one is on the king side. This makes a big difference. It's not just a whole copy party. It could become a copy party if we play some very bland passe moves, like knight c3, knight f6, oh look, now it's a copy party. But at least, at least here, there's the asymmetry and the respect that um, white is to play, and so somebody always has to move. There's no completely symmetrical position in chess because of that. Um, although, of course, people talk about symmetry in a different way. Talk about the pawn structure usually when we talk about symmetry in chess. But um, anyway, if we're worried about people copying, just remember there's always something different for each side. It's never completely symmetrical in that way, in the intuitive sense. So I often recommend that um, my students, you know, when I when I do take students or the people who visit my stream and get free advice on my Discord server, I often advise them to just play a variety of things, especially if you're young. Like if, if you're a kid, in, in the early days, you can always you can blame everything on being a kid, right? You you can just be like, oh, I played a bad move because I'm a kid and I didn't know better. I'll do better later, and people will be like, oh yeah, that's fine. They're a kid. And if you do really great as a kid, they're like, wow, you're an amazing prodigy. But as an adult, if you make a mistake, they're like, why would you do that? Well, didn't you learn how to do that as a kid? And if you do something great, they're just like, meh. So, especially if you're young, try different things. Have fun. So C3 is, is one move that I think um, it kind of adds spice to the life of a starting chess player. Because people tend to... An another common rule, which I also made a video about, is people say, like, develop, develop your knights and develop your bishops before you castle, right? So they'll usually end up with both knights out. They'll pick just the most obvious way of attacking the center. So they often end up putting this knight on c3, which means you cannot play pawn c3, and then we get into that kind of, like, a little bit stale territory. Um, this can still be very interesting. For example, like, let's say we just keep doing the symmetrical thing, right? And then, like, um, somebody breaks the symmetry. Let's pretend that... Let's pretend that white plays h3, and then black's like, hmm, I don't see why I should play h6. I'm going to castle instead. Things get very spicy after bishop g5. This is called the annoying pen. And uh, I've already um, already explained this many times. But of course, if anyone wants to see, you can leave a comment, and we can talk about that another time. So um, c3 is mutually exclusive with knight c3. It has a completely different purpose, um, and it can add some spice to your life. So after c3, we basically are saying, I want to play, no, not that far, d4, right? The pawn is supporting the d4 advance. And you might be wondering, like, well, why am I moving a pawn? It's not, not helping my pieces at all. Um, why is d4 that important? Well, having two pawns in the center, it turns out, is pretty, pretty cool. Because the pawns can just steamroll the knights if they're on these obvious squares. So that's a pretty good starter player strategy. And it also has deeper motivations. Like, modern grandmasters often play c3 in this position. They purposely steer into this territory. It's, a, it's still a discussion point to this day. Now, the, the typical move that people play in modern times is knight f6. And the idea Roni here is that after d4, um, they basically have to take this pawn, because if they don't, uh, white has full reign of the center and rules all the universe. Specifically, we, we want to take this pawn. So th they want to avoid that fate, so they take here. We take back with the pawn, because if we take with the knight, that's boring. It's boring because... Um, can we take this pawn? We take two twenty-seven. Yeah. So the e pawn's just hanging. So that's kind of boring. Um, and besides, even if Black is not ambitious and they just play something like Knight takes d four and then d six, like we don't have that big center. It's nice to have the two pawns. So so we do the two pawn thing. Um, and here there's only there's a string of moves that are like only moves. That this is part of why this was popular for a long time um, until recently. Now, now modern grandmasters are, are actually not playing d4. They're usually playing d3. Um, so, anyway, the, the forcing sequence after d4 is they have to play bishop d4 check because every other move is too passive. If you play like any other move, it's going to be e5 or d5, and these moves are the bees knees, so they have to do this. And then this is where we get into this Greco gambit with knight c3. It's, called, it's a gambit because there's a pin, and so this e-pawn's hanging. Um, and then there's this bishop d2, which often ends in a draw by repetition. We'll, we'll talk about those more later. I just want to give some uh, foreshadowing. Now, in this game, black did not play knight f6. They played queen e7, which was even played as recently as, like, I think someone, I think I remember seeing a game 
in this kind of spirit in like the time when Car Pop was playing. So remember I checked some Car Pop games for Italian at, at one point. Um, so yeah, Queen E7, kind of an odd move. It's like kind of saying I'm spying on your king. You know, if the center clears up, that could be a check. Um, but it, it also is forfeiting the support of the d5 advance, and it turns out that's very important. That didn't develop until later. Um, in the 1600s, people did not know that, as far as I can tell. There's no evidence of it. They were trying all these tactical maneuvery things. So, um, by the way, it, around this time, the opening got its name, and people called it, so first there's Giuoco Piano, um, that's one name for the Italian opening. Um, which just means quiet game. And you might be wondering, like, why would they call this quiet game? It's got all these flashy tactics and stuff. Well, by the by, the standards of a 1600s chess player, um, this is like a relatively staid approach to the opening. It's, it's kind of slow. You're saying, like, why are we playing c3? That, that's a slow move. But it turns out it, it's still very aggressive compared to modern chess. So for us, it's not really quiet. But for them, it was relatively relatively quiet. No sacrifices on, like, move two. Like in the King's Gambit, which is probably probably the oldest chest opening of all. Um, the only one that I think rivals the King's Gambit for age is like the Spanish, I think. Well, even then, I'm, I'm not completely sure. Um, but King's Gambit is, is very old. And that's certainly much more aggressive. So by comparison with, with these other openings that were popular at the time, Italian's kind of slow. Hence the name, Gioco Piano, quiet game. It's funny how Piano means like five things in Italian. So yeah, Queen E7, a little bit odd. So Greco did the beginner thing which is good, you know, we, we can't slight him for castling, good move. And here black could probably develop a, a knight, um, maybe they could have played like this, and then if knight g5 they castle, I think black would be okay there. Um, so I'm not, not too impressed with knight g5, I think knight f6 is probably reasonable, but they played d6, also a sensible move. Um, trying to get this bishop out. But you can see that they it kind of feels like they're behind in development because this queen move is not especially useful. In fact, it, it can become detrimental because now look who's lined up, the queen and the king. So Greco tries to open the center. That's one of the main reasons that we played moves like d4. So um, I think it's understandable if they didn't take it, they were trying to keep the e-file as close as possible. They played this one. Um, but they still have other, other problems. Here, I think the only really good move is bishop g5. Yeah, piano means like an instrument, the piano. Um, just responding to Shai's comment that piano means a lot of things. Yeah, it's a versatile kind of word. It means the the piano that we play on, you know, dun 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 dun. And it means floor in some context, and it also means, well, it also means quiet. So, juoco is game, piano is quiet. And pianissimo means very quiet. It does not, however, mean very floor or very piano. Okay. So, I think it's called a declination, but I, I don't remember. I can never remember these linguistic terms. So, anyway, I think bishop g5 is the only really good move, and Greco found it and published it. And so here, the best move is probably knight f6 again. This is kind of becoming very similar to um, what would happen if black had played knight f6 earlier in the game. But the, it played pawn f6, and as you can see, I've marked this with a question mark. It has a big fat symbol on the board that I kind of was hoping would not pop up. Um, but anyway, this, open, this, is, this move is a mistake in a strategic sense, because long term your king is open, oh sorry, the king is open on two different diagonals, and you could escape this and it won't be a problem if you could castle queenside for example, but black is not really uh, in the mood for that. So Greco played bishop h4, normal move, and after g5, I wonder if you guys want to guess the move. This is a tactical moment, and it's based on the weakness of Black's king. It's also something of a strategic moment. Um, Shai, that's a good guess. Bishop takes g5 um, is in the right spirit, but I think it's not the most active, aggressive way that you can play here. Try to be even more active than this. After bishop g5, fg5, um, we don't really have the option to play knight g5. I think we would probably have to like switch gears and play like queen b3 at that point. 
but it's not. I don't feel optimistic about it. It's actually knight takes g5. And the idea with knight takes g5 is that after f takes g5, we get this one. This is a classic tactical shot, and Greco has played this many times. The games that I selected, they're kind of like just a, a sampling of the games that Greco played. And he, he played many games that were almost completely identical. I just chose a couple representative games. Um, so in, in this game, uh, they played king d7. They probably could have chosen, like for example, king f8. Um, but it, it's really all the same. They're just doomed. Because after any move that they play, here comes bishop g5. And you might be thinking, oh, white is down a piece because we lost this knight, right? Knight's gone, got only two pawns. And if you can count on your fingers and remember your coach's advice that a knight is worth three pawns, you'll say, wait a minute, I'm down a pawn. This is terrible. But um, it turns out that the numerical rules for the values of the pieces and so on don't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, what I see here is a king on d7. That looks very strange. Like, when are they ever going to use this rook? Maybe, they're, maybe they are the ones who are down five points in that respect. So they played queen f8, which is also kind of like not inspiring, honestly. Um, they could have tried this move, but I think there's also just something lacking in this because even though our queen is under attack, we can just mitigate that situation appropriately. Like, for example, queen h4. Um, so queen f8 is what they did. And I think there's multiple moves that make sense here. Um, but Greco's choice is kind of interesting. It demonstrated a, a high level of, of thought here. Basically, he's saying, I control these squares from the bishop. These squares are effectively under control because they're blocked by black pieces. I control this one because of the bishop. So what do I need to win the game, right? He's saying... I need to win these two. The queen is covering this one, but we might need the queen in other ways. So, um, since we can't play bishop e6, and we can't prepare bishop e6, we would like to play queen h3 or queen g4 to attack this square. But if we did that, it would leave e8 unguarded. So, see if you can guess the move that he played based on that. He wants to attack on this diagonal with the queen, because that's more possible than with the bishop. Um, but he doesn't want to lose control of e8. It's a weird looking move, in my opinion. It's, it's not utterly crazy, but it's just kind of uncommon. Bishop g7, I think you mean bishop f7, that's correct. Yeah, so this is what he played. He played bishop f7 over protecting e8, and now he's threatening me. It doesn't really matter that he's interfering with the queen, but he's also doing that. So they played knight e7 in order to free up the d8 square, or maybe the c6 square. But after d takes e5, he can't really take back, so this is becoming a complete dumpster fire. Like, if he takes, then I, I believe this is going to win the game. I, I keep right-clicking by accident, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, he would have to go, like, here... And then we can play this, which is also a very strange looking move. It's, it's pleasant to play these weird moves. And then after king c5, probably we'll come back with bishop e3. You know, it's a king hunt. Once you see that the king is running like this, you just say, why are you running? And then you play the sequence and see if you can checkmate them. Um, anyway, so they didn't take back. They played h6, which is not really inspiring either. Um, bishop h4, we still have uh, threats on the menu move the rook to try to capture this bishop, but it's all to no avail. Um, I think at, at this point, it's pretty easy to, to find the finish, e6. Um, they should probably play, I don't know, king c6 just seems completely insane to me, but king d8 also doesn't look very good. So they played king c6. And after bishop e8, they had to sack the queen and resign. Because here it's going to be one of those king walks. Like, they have to go here. It's probably going to be a very short walk off a steep cliff. 
as they say. Uh, maybe B4. I'm just kind of guessing here. Maybe this. And what can we do with rooks? The hunt is on. Yeah, I see one mate. For example, they go here. Maybe even just a slow mate is better. Like, just bring the queen back. There's just no way they'll survive. We could do something like this or something like this. You know, there's options. Okay, so this is how the game ended. They just resigned here after queen takes e8. It's a depressing position. Makes sense. And this all arose from them playing queen e7. Not preventing this d4 advance, which turns out is very strong. Classical Italian opening advance. And then after bishop g5, they just had tactical problems that they couldn't resolve with f6. It's not pleasant to have to pin your knight either, so I kind of just recommend people to stay away from playing queen e7 as black. And as white, it's nice to go after their queen in such situations. So here's the next game. Um, this is actually in line with um, modern theory. So this is the first example that I think has not really... It has really stood the test of time. So d6 is kind of like queen e7, because usually people will play d6 and then queen e7. Otherwise, it would be like, why not just prepare d5, right? So d6 is kind of in a similar boat. And it's a somewhat inferior move, but it was played as recently as the 80s. Um, and even in modern times, despite the propensity of grandmasters for uh, playing d3 in these positions in, mo in uh, modern chess, you know, um, when black plays something that's kind of not that great, usually we play d4. So this is kind of a, a cool lesson. Usually against underwhelming moves for, for black, you play the most ambitious move for white. So d4 is very ambitious. They have to take black play bishop b4 check. And this is not the same as the position I showed earlier, okay? But it does have a similar character to this Greco gambit, okay? So Greco played knight c3. Uh, but I, I want to just point out a similar position that is also a discussion point um, for starting players. So after c3, if you play knight f6, which is the better move, we still end up in a position similar to this. But at least black has something uh, going for them here because in this position, they haven't played d6, they have played knight f6 instead, and that gives them the extra option to take this pawn. And it turns out that this is wildly complicated after castling. We'll see more about this later. This is just for comparison purposes. Coming back to the game, this is the position that we have. See, they don't have a knight on f6, so they can't play knight takes e4. So, losing this time, like allowing white to play d4 and moving your bishop repeatedly, it doesn't really benefit black very much because they, they can't really apply pressure to this e-pawn. It's too late. So d6 was just a waste of time. So they played knight f6. Um, that's not how knights move. If they could do this, um, black would probably be able to do something cool. But, you know, they want to take this pawn in e4. So guess what white does? They castle, which would have been the next move in, in the Greco Gambit main line. Um, and black made a kind of typical mistake um, they got greedy to take the pawn before they castled. Sometimes you have to. Like in the other line I said, at least black can take the pawn, and that's that's good for black, but it really is complicated. Um, but in a situation like this, where you have to like work very hard to get the pawn, like sacrificing your bishop for a knight and bolstering white center to take it, it's very dangerous. So they played knight takes e4, no castling. Oh, by the way, in the other line, white had not castled yet when they played knight e4. So that was part of the justification. Now, after rook e1, um, their knight is kind of just toasted. They have to play d5 to try to hang on. Um, but this allows a tactical sequence, which I think is very cool. And I've played it in the game. I think my friend, Coach Luis, has played it in the game. Um, anyone who's been watching this channel for a couple years will know that I used to stream a lot with Coach Luis. Uh, but now I'm staying elsewhere, so we don't really stream that much. But he's also very good. He's in our Discord. And um, if you guys want to bounce ideas off of me or Chris Luis or anybody, you can definitely just show up. Just ask for a link in the chat, and I will post a Discord link for you. So you can join us. Keep studying. 
So, um, I think it, it might be good to guess the move here. It's kind of a, a crazy combination, so let's just see if we can guess the first move. It's a forcing move. I don't think I've made a video yet specifically about forcing moves, but, but the notion of a forcing move is that it's a move after which the play becomes uh, very concrete, and so situations like that are kind of easy to analyze, and they can sometimes lead to advantageous positions. So we have to analyze these forcing combinations. Um, some examples of forcing moves that come to my mind are, in this case, checks and captures. So that's a capture, that's a capture and a check. So my guess for where to start would be rook takes e4. It doesn't matter how I feel about that move. If I'm worried about losing the rook, I don't care. We analyze forcing moves. Um, no matter how we feel about it. So this is the move that actually happened in the game, so I'll play it. Now this knight's hanging, so I think it's pretty clear what has to happen next. Knight g5. This doesn't mean you should automatically play the sequence in a game. It just means we have to like imagine it ahead of time and um, develop the calculating ability to foresee and assess the consequences. So now there's a big threat on f7, and black is kind of happily up in exchange, but um, I think it's not not really that simple. For example, if they try to trade pieces, at, even at the cost of a pawn, like if they play bishop e6, I don't know which I would rather do, honestly. Take with the bishop and get a knight on e6, which looks potentially strong, or take with the knight and get a bishop on e6, which looks even stronger. Yeah, I think probably if they try to sacrifice, they'd like end up up material anyway, but you can see that their position has a lot of downsides that white does not have. Like, they can't castle this way, they can't castle this way. I think this bishop's at least as strong as a rook. So you can just forget about the value of the pieces in these um, open dynamic positions. So being up in exchange does not really help them here. They have to deal with the threat on f7. So castling's what they did. Um, probably, probably they're just busted here already. They might have to play something really sad to just keep the game going, like sack this rook. But they, they castled. And now at this point, there, there's a, a move which is is winning the game that's kind of, it's easy to find because it, it's just a tempting move in general. But to see that it wins the game is a little bit tricky. So that's what I, I would ask you guys to do. If you're watching the recording, just like pause and see if you can find a winning sequence for white. Anybody in the chat who wants to uh, post an idea, feel free. You can at least guess the first move and I'll let you know if you're right or or not, right? One thing that's clear is that we've built up a lot of pressure on this side of the board, starting with the attack on f7. So we have kind of a local presence. Yeah, Shai's got the first move, queen h5. Now this move is kind of obvious because it threatens checkmate. We love checkmate. <laughs> so If they play a move that guards the checkmate that's active, for example, if they play bishop f5, um, this is kind of interesting because we have three attackers on this square. One, two, three. One of those trades. So we could actually just take the f-pawn. So they would end up losing that material, and their king would be under attack, and they would have some other problems. For example, like probably I would start like this because it attacks the queen and it opens up the path to the king. This discover check threat is even stronger than actually checking their king. So I would probably take like this. And this attacks the bishop, so I think I think they're busted. So direct defense doesn't make sense. So the line we have to consider is h6. How do we win after this move? Still knight takes f7, that's right. So we take it. And if they take with the rook, um, I think taking with the queen makes a lot of sense. Maybe it's not like 100% winning on the spot like what I said, but it, it certainly does feel that way. Like after king h8, I think all white has to do is like finish their development. They're probably doing great. Like maybe, maybe do this. 
the idea here really though is to prevent knight e5 so that I can play d4 or d5. This looks kind of interesting to me. Like, let's kick this knight, attack g7. I don't know. I think it, this is winning. Maybe it's not as clear as I thought initially though. There's no mate in sight. Um, but white's definitely better. So they would probably play something different. In the game they played queen f6, which is probably just like the hideous blunder really. Um, because it allows a classic tactical shot. So if you want to pause and look for the tactical shot here, this is a good chance. It's just a one move tactic. Bishop's looking at the king. So it's knight takes h6. And now their king has to step on the h file, and that does not look very good. So they play king h8. And this is mate in two. If I can count correctly, that is. Um, so if you want to try to find the mate in two, this is a good moment for that. How many times is this knight going to visit f7, right? It's been there like three times already. Isn't black supposed to be the one who like uses their side of the board? And that's me. So this was another interesting Greco game. And this one's representative of modern practice too. Black plays an underwhelming move, white plays d4. That's very, very common. The reason that d3 is more common now is not that people got tired of winning with d4. The reason is that if black plays very active defense, d4 is not as effective as a more slow maneuvering approach in modern chess. The level of defensive play is much, much higher. Obviously, um, in these games, black is not choosing the best defense all the time, but you know this was the early days. So here's another game, another Italian situation. It's not really Italian opening exactly, but I still thought it was important to show it. This is like the two knights thing. So white plays this Italian setup, black declines to play the actual Italian with bishop c5, they play knight f6. And back in the day, people loved to play this fried liver attack. So this is what we're looking at now. And if, you're, if your rating's below 1500, probably shivers are going down your spine right now because this is such a terrifying thing to face for starting players. It means you have to think, and you know, no one really likes to do that. So um, that's kind of the, the main challenge of this fried liver attack when you play knight g5. It forces your opponent to find accurate defensive moves. But objectively, this opening is not really that great, and it pains, pains me to say so, really, because um, I played this with great success, on, even until I was a candidate master, and I just really thought that it made sense to learn all the theory for this opening so that I could just out-prepare people, because at a, at a GM level, there's a lot of preparation behind the fried liver attack that um, makes it viable. But it's just so much work to learn this opening. Like, there's, there's just reams and reams of theory. Um, and for what? So that if someone happens to play it against you, you can play knight g5 and then suffer. White suffering as much as black in this opening. Because you have to, like, prove that your sacrifices make sense. The ones that come. But in the early days, they were simpler times. So if, you, if you're in the early days of your chess career, you should also enjoy the simple times. Play knight g5, enjoy some attacking chess. So d5 is basically the only recourse. Um, there are a couple other, there's basically one other option. This is called the Traxler Trap. This didn't really exist in the 1600s. Um, the idea is that after knight takes f7, you can sacrifice on f2, and black is basically acting like they're white. They are launching a big attack suddenly, their development is greater, and if, if white doesn't play accurately, they, they can lose pretty easily. Like if they play this move, for some, peop for some reason, people like to put their king back where it came from, even if it makes no sense at all. I don't know why. It just makes them feel comfortable. You can't even castle when your king's moved in, in the beginning of the game, so I, I don't really understand it. But, you know, it allows tactical shots like this, which is why I'm showing you. Um, common mistake, common reputation, common disaster zone. So, they have to play g3 here, and I think, there's a, I think this is a forced draw, but it's, it's easy to mess up. Oh no, it's not a force draw here. It's a force draw if they play um, king g1. So, point being, after bishop c5, um, white should not play knight f7. They should um, switch gears, play this move. Bishop takes f7 is much stronger because after king e7, bishop d5, there might even be another option here, but I think bishop d5 is the best. Um, their coordination is really weird, like their king's in a weird spot. And because e4 is protected, they can't really do the bishop f2 thing. So this is just a little little biopic about the Traxler trap. 
Um, and this is why d5 is virtually the only move here, okay? Because the only other thing that makes it complicated um, actually has a problem. It allows bishop takes f7. So d5 is the only move that actively prevents this without like sacrificing your whole life. So after pawn takes d5, uh, black has options again. They have several options actually. In, in modern times, people are mostly playing knight a5. Um, this is, I think, probably the best option. You can also play b5 and knight d4. These might come as um, surprising moves, but you know when the position opens up like this and it gets very tactical, surprises abound. For example, b5 is probably like the last move you would consider making if you haven't studied any theory. Uh, but the idea is that after bishop takes b5, the obvious move, queen d5 is, is pretty good, you know? Hits the bishop, gets rid of this problem pawn, hits g2. So, you know, they can't just develop a tempo this time. This is not like the situations we looked at earlier where the queen comes out early. The queen is actually doing stuff out here, doing work. Um, so that's the idea behind b5. Um, Knight d4 is, is pretty similar, like if I play c3, we're going to play b5. We're just putting the knight on a very active square and attacking, trying to repel the bishop and take the d-pawn. Um, knight a5 is, is a pretty um, typical response these days too, which is also complicated. The whole thing's complicated. I just wanted to show that like there are, there are real options here. And I think that it, it's generally regarded as a mistake, even if this holds up in computer play to play knight takes d5. And in the 1600s, it was definitely a mistake to play knight takes d5 because they did not even have computers to help them back up their ambitious play. The, the problem with knight takes d5, you know, it looks quite natural because we have the knight in the center of the board, it's supported, we have big center control, what, what could be worse? I mean, what could be better for black? This is terrible for white in that sense. But there's a very concrete opportunity here that Greco kind of pioneered as well knight takes f7, and this is regarded as the main line still. So after king takes, um, next you have to play queen f3, otherwise you're just down a piece. You need to create this double attack to force the king into the middle. And now this is pinned under pressure, so we keep applying the pressure. This is a no-brainer to play. And in this game they play knight e7, which is kind of weird. Um, in, in modern times they play knight b4, which it looks like it's an aggressive move, but it's really not. Like, people often sacrifice this pawn to capture on d5 and keep attacking black's king. Um, it's just more accurate because it doesn't permit the move pawn d4. It turns out that after 97, d4 is a great move. And the idea is that, of course, if they take this, they lose a piece. That's bad. Because they have nowhere to put the king that sustains the support of this three-fold attack knight. Like, if they go here, it cuts off the queen. We just snag it and say thank you. So so d4 is a cool idea. And after knight b4, it's not really happening. So, but back then, uh, Greco also made tactical mistakes. Even the strongest players were not that strong in the first, like, between 1600 and 1800. Philidor was probably rated like 1900. I'd like thrash him day in and day out, but he's, he's famous for several endgame positions and an opening, so gives you an idea of the level of play back then. It's just going up and up. So, um, castling was Greco's choice, which is, is logical, but it's just not as good as the ambitious move d4. And after c6, black appears to have consolidated. But here I also would play d4, but Greco played rook e1, which makes sense, he's preparing d4. Um, after bishop d7, it seems kind of like black is not prioritizing the safety of their king. They just don't seem to believe that it's a problem. Like, why is this move useful? What, so you can maneuver? Like, we don't have three moves in a row here as black. So probably it would have been better to play, like, I don't know, king king to uh, d6 or something, try to, like, run over here. But even this is kind of sad. Like, black's pieces are just not coordinating. The knight's blocking the bishop, so they can't, like, plug the dark squares with bishop d6. It's just a nightmare. Like, they're up a piece, but they can't use their pieces. So material doesn't matter still. So here comes d4. He finally played this move. Here comes rook takes e5. Very active play. Now after after knight g6, um, Greco took a tactical approach. He played knight takes d5. 
And this makes a lot of sense logically, because if they take back and say, oh, I can take the rook when I want, it turns out that they're just completely wrong. You know, we can just take it with the rook and save everything, or take with the queen, go for a checkmating attack. This is a big attack. So they're actually forced to play this move. So it makes sense to analyze this far. Um, so now after d takes e5 check, this is actually very encouraging for an attacking player, because you can see that the knight's presence on d5, even though the knight's under attack, because we haven't retreated it, they actually can't take any natural steps back towards their side of the board. We're constantly bringing the king in. This was a strategy that Greco employed over and over again, like constantly. If they go here, they step into a discover attack, so they played king c5, but this is basically game over. So here comes queen a3. The king still can't go back anywhere. Took the bishop, boohoo. Queen d3, so now they can't use any of the light squares. And now it's mate and one, b4. So this was a very nice um, checkmating attack that came like kind of out of the blue. He didn't even play the most ambitious moves um, in the beginning, but because black played like one lackluster move, right? Well, maybe maybe two. 97, you know, it's hard to anticipate that this is bad, it, but it is. But then at bishop d7 was definitely bad, and this is kind of where things went sour. And the checkmating attack began. All right, so that was a cool game. <coughs> This one's really short, seven moves. All right, so this is actually one of the modern main lines. Um, people don't really play d4 that much. They usually play d3, um, but you know, d4 it is. And this is an example where um, black does not, black does not acknowledge that the, the d4 move is strong. They should have taken on d4, but they played bishop b6. So this is a tactical moment. You might want to pause the video if you're watching the replay, or you could hit me up with the move in the chat. What do you think white should be doing here? And maybe give like a two-move sequence. Black resigned in, on move seven here, and this is move five. <coughs> By the way, anyone who's interested in, in supporting me and my stream. Um, I have a GoFundMe out right now because a natural disaster kind of like wrecked my life. I made a little video about it. So if you guys want to watch that, um, that's on my channel. I think it's a featured video right now. Um, there was a flood that destroyed my house and my car. And so if you guys want to support and help me keep doing this, you could contribute to the GoFundMe. I just have a, a goal of raising like $2,000 to cover some of the costs associated with the damage. So. If you're interested, um, you can go search for that. That's on. That's in another video on my on my channel. It's pretty obvious if you just click on my homepage, or you can ask for a link in the chat. Just let me know. Okay. So the the idea here in this position is that when you don't take on d4, it gives an opportunity to take on e5. So white takes, and after knight takes e4, there's a double attack. This is a, a standard normal double attack move happens very often. It's queen to d5. You should keep in mind that queen d5 is not always the best move when there's a piece hanging on e4. Sometimes you have to start with this and then play queen d5. It depends on whether or not they can play queen e7, which guards both. But here, because there's a pawn on e5, queen e7 does not guard the knight on e4. Imagine if you played queen d5 and queen e7 did guard the knight. This would just be kind of a normal position. Um, but because there's a pawn in the way, they're going to lose this knight. They have to resign. If they try to protect, they just lose it. You know, we just take the knight. <coughs> so that was a small game. So we've already seen a little bit about this. Oh, we've already... This is, this is a different game where um, it's like the same as another position we saw, but they play king d8. I just wanted to show how, after knight f6, the move that Greco chose was queen a6 to put pressure, not queen h4. Um, this keeps some other active possibilities alive. So after rook f8, um, here's a tactical moment that I wanted to talk about. Uh, we've already analyzed the early part of this game, basically, because Greco played a few games that were very similar to each other. So now I'm wondering what you guys think we should do to increase the pressure. We sacrificed a piece, 
this is pinned, but you know, it's protected a lot, so how are we going to make progress? Here's a hint. These guys are sleeping. If we could somehow deal with that, that would be really great. Get the pieces involved. Also somehow start an attack against this knight. That would be a pretty cohesive opening strategy. If we do d takes e5 here, I think that this would activate their knight. I would be concerned about this bishop hanging. And maybe even like knight f7 at some point. Well, knight f7 would run into queen takes f6. So I think, I just don't really like that their knight is on e5. Um, if you had some kind of cool follow-up, let me know though. He takes e5, knight takes e5, what could it be? If it was d takes and then d takes, I, I would see your point, because then you could maybe throw rook d1. Yeah, shy, f4 is the move. It looks very risky because this is hanging, but we don't care, we're fast. So Greco played f4, good move. And after e takes d4, e5 now, um, everything's going to get opened up. So they took on c3, king h1, pawn takes b2, looks very scary, <coughs> but after pawn takes f6, um, if they move the queen, like if they play this, this move, then f7 check is going to lead to checkmate it, like for sure. So... Well, actually, no. I don't know what I'm saying. After queen e3, there's just queen takes f8, and that will lead to checkmate. Um, it's better to take this with check. So, they basically are forced to take and make a queen. So, it looks good for them. You know, lots of material, but they have not activated their pieces, right? These guys are sleeping or busy. <laughs> and besides, pawn takes e7 gets the queen back anyway. So, after this, they had to play knight takes e7. Um, because if they play king e8, then, you know, we get a queen. Another queen. Pretty bad. I wonder if there's a mate this way. Yeah. So, so they had to play knight takes e7, but this runs into queen f8. You know, it, it's clear that this, this queen on a1 is not um, doing anything useful. This should be five's a nice touch. I think most people will be tempted to just take this, but then the king runs out. And definitely white's still winning here, but... It's, it's just nicer to um, finish it with style. If they play, um, for example, pawn c6 here, which is kind of the stock reaction, you know, you block with a pawn, um, this runs into mate. That's the idea, to fill up the c6 square. So they play knight c6 to try to avoid that fate. And it turns out our move is the same, queen e7, because now the knight's pinned. So this is a nice game, really short game. All right, so here's another example of um, white playing this old d4 main line. Your master, welcome. You always forget. You're always sleeping or something. I don't know. <laughs> it, it's okay, though. Welcome to the stream. And you can always watch the replay. We've already gone through, like, six games or something from Greco. So anyway, um, these moves we've already seen. And this is the Greco Gambit. And someone was asking me about this specifically, like, last night. So I want to address this with... Some, some degree of detail. Um, the main line here is knight takes e4. If you don't play knight takes e4, you're kind of worse. This is one reason that I think it's good for people who are just starting to learn a little bit of Italian theory. Um, it, like, even just the smallest bit of theory, like knowing that d4 is good, and knowing that you might want to advance with e5, and that if black doesn't play some particular moves, they're worse, that is already powerful against players who are rated like 1200 or below. So anyway, they have to play knight takes e4. And why? Um, let's pretend that they play something different, like um, let's pretend they castle, because this is something like, oh, my coach told me castle, I'm going to castle without thinking. Um, I think I would start in with, oh, how do I want to start this? I don't remember what the best move is here. I'm going to peek at the opening book and see what the most common move is. Nope, no games here. Castling's a really bad move, so people haven't played it. Um, probably e5. My only qualm about e5 is that they might play d5 as a counter strike. But this might be an example where we can take on g7 and it's like not good for them. Uh, 
Um, another idea that comes to my mind is d5. After knight a5, which I think is the most logical, we can play this move, bishop d3. Um, and this also has some small tactical details, so I'm kind of wondering now, like, what's the best move? I knew what the best move was here, but it seems like I'm forgetting. Could be bishop g5 or just castling. It might be... Hmm. It could even be, like, just bishop d3. I'm going to check on the computer quickly, because I'm having some indecision. Yeah, it's bishop g5. So, if they play h6, we don't go here, because I think that probably black has some compensation after g5. This looks very Greco-esque, like, I don't know, maybe we could even sacrifice a piece here, like this. Yeah, maybe g5 is not good. So, what's the issue with bishop h4? I don't know, suddenly I'm kind of like, going deep into my thoughts. Well, this is a little bit of a tangent, so maybe we could come back to this um, in a moment. But, in general, the issue with castling is that you're going to run into a problem involving either d5 or e5. Whether white develops a piece first or not, that's a different issue. <coughs> yeah, e5, d5 at the same time. That would be fantastic. We just push them. Bishop e7 in that line? Okay, yeah, let's go back. Maybe it's... We'll just take one, one more peek. I wanted to show what Greco did, um, but we can definitely to rationalize this, so. Oh wait, g5 first, right. I think that after bishop e7, white still has some, like, good play here. Like, you could play either h4 or, or like, d5 and then, well, maybe not d5, because maybe d5. I don't know, I'm just wondering about this position. I think I could stare at this for hours, so I'd probably have to be a little bit better prepared to answer what happens exactly in this position. Um, but anyway, I just know it's, it's good for white. That's good enough for me. So, oh, I think I'm still on my sideline. Yeah, so in the game we play knight takes e4, and this is the best move. Um, still is, was in the 1600s. This is the main line. And I know this a lot better, so we can stay here. So, castling happened, and this is also mainline stuff. Um, yeah, it, it might be defendable. It, it's very hard to say without a thorough analysis, because I know there are some, there are some lines in the D3 Italian where um, black does the same thing. They play a6 and g5, and they either get a forced draw, where white has choice, or they lose. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm pretty suspicious of it. But that it also seems logical that that's the way to go. Um, but anyway, so in, in this game, Greco Castle, and I just want to show um, a classic mistake that someone played in this game. This mistake has happened over and over again. Probably someone's making this mistake right now. If I wait like five minutes and just like listen to the internet for all the games that are like whirring around in the, the radio frequencies, um, probably a bunch of them are um, in this position, and a bunch of them play Knight takes C3. Mistake big yellow question mark. And the reason for this is pretty subtle, because <clears throat> the logic behind it is that I'm attacking this twice. Uh, that's not how bishops move. That's how they move. And it's only defended once, so boohoo, they're going to lose the knight. Um, so how do we take it? If you take with the knight, the issue is that after pawn takes c3, you're basically beholden to take on c3. And you might even think this is like a good thing. You're like, ooh, I'm getting my bishop in. But we've spent so many moves, right? We're taking the, the rook in three moves. We've spent three moves to collect this pawn. Meanwhile, white has just rapidly developed all their pieces. So probably you guys are um, probably you guys are a little bit familiar that um, white is going to sacrifice this rook. But how are they going to sacrifice the rook? So if you if you want to pause the video, if you are watching a replay, or if you're live, if you want to say something in the chat, uh, what do you think white should do? to sacrifice the rook on a1 the best way to get an attack rolling.
keep in mind like why we play these Italian moves, right? So knight f3, it attacks the center. So you have a lot of active possibilities. Knight g5 sometimes in the cards. When we play bishop c4, we control the center. We also attack this weak point. We castle quickly, so we have the opportunity to bring the rook to the e file. So these are all things to consider here. <coughs> Bishop a3 is an interesting suggestion from Eater Master. Bishop a3, bishop a1, and then rook e1. I think that um, assuming that they will take the rook is not safe. Like, yeah, we should have that in our, in our mind, but it doesn't mean we assume that they do it. Um, I think that after bishop a3, they would play d6. Or d5. Probably d6. Um, I wonder if d5 is better. Let's just quickly check. So I think d6, but if they play d5. Sorry, I'm just like brains going burnt. I was thinking about rookie one sacrifice. Yeah, I think d5 is good, because if we play something like this, they can take the rook, because rook e1 check is not a big deal. We could always play like king d7, which is, is weird, but it's possible. Um, white has some compensation, though. I think d5 is strong, though. Usually black wants to play d5, but even, even d6 looks okay. Because, um, anyway, yeah, they're just both good. So they won't take the rook right away. But you were right, though, that if they take the rook, this check is very powerful because the king's trapped and they don't have any good blocks. Like, they might play this and then lose their whole face. So d6 happened. Um, I'm sorry, no, not d6. Queen b3 was the move, okay? So after queen b3, they're forcing the bishop to take on a1 and simultaneously pressuring f7 a lot. So this is very nice um, for white. So this is one of white's motivations for choosing this Greco Gambit, that if black plays kind of passe moves like this one, they get completely wrecked. Um, for example, bishop f7. Um, this is actually a, a different game, but I'll, I'll show you. After king f8, um, the best move is bishop to g5. Trapping the queen, they have to play knight e7. And then after knight e5, there's a tactical uh, idea. If you try to save the bishop that was hanging on a1, they play bishop g6. And this is a double checkmate threat on the same square, which is kind of luxuriant. They just can't take the knight or the bishop because of this, this mate. And they have to start throwing the pieces away like that. Queen b3, yes, telling the future. So in the game, they play bishop d4. Um, I guess they're saying, I'm not that greedy, I just want all your pawns. Really weird weird thing to say. Um, but, you know, after bishop f7, we see a very similar fate. They play bishop f6. I guess this is part of where the issue lay. Maybe, maybe they calculated and saw that taking the rook was uh, no bueno, and they wanted to try to just consolidate this position. But I don't know why you would want this position, right? So, white has four pawns, black has six pawns. Um, but black has lost castling and can't move any of their pieces. So, like, they can't even play d5. But here's an interesting moment. What do you think white should play here? How do we proceed? So if you want to guess the move, just put it in the chat. Yeah, rook e1. Maybe it doesn't even matter which one. Greco chose rook a e1 with rook e8 on the menu. So this forces knight e7. Not very encouraging for the for the black side, right? Like they keep having to move the same pieces over and over again um, just to stay in the game. So that's kind of not not cool. Um, Greco played bishop h5, which threatens mate, and it forces them to put a piece on g6. If they play pawn g6, um, this just hangs a bishop. So white is winning for obvious reasons. So they played knight g6. 
Okay, so now what should the move be? Any thoughts? So this knight has barely made it in time to protect the king. No obvious tactics here yet. How do we improve the position for white? This is probably the, the most challenging play that we've seen so far against Greco. Black's really hanging in there. Okay, so the move that Greco played is knight e5, and I, I think this move is, is very strong. It's giving up the bishop on g5. I mean, it looks like it. Basically, like you might think, oh, I need to hold my bishop, but you don't, because after after knight e5, there's a mate threat. They have to deal with it. So they have to take out this knight on e5, but there's no comfortable way to take it out, because if they take with the knight, then the, the knight is no longer sheltering f7 long term. They're going to have to make further concessions to, to hang on. If they take with the bishop, they lose the queen, so it's really just not good for them. Um, they have no way of guarding the f7 square in other ways, because we have multiple threats like... For example, if they play queen e7, this is already hideous, because they can take this and then take the queen. And same for queen e8, I mean, just there's, n there's no way. Um, if they play d5, this runs into another problem, um, which is that, I'm trying to see if there's any issues with the execution here. I was thinking bishop g6. Is there any difference here? No, it should be knight g6 to have rook e8. That's the difference. If they play bishop g5, we just take, uh, uh, play rook e8. So, um, so even d5 doesn't work. So they play knight e5, kind of desperate. After rook e5, they still can't take the rook. And they still can't take the bishop because of rook e8, so they had to play g6. But this runs into bishop h6, bishop g7. And now here is a tricky moment. See if you guys can spot the move for white. It's a cool move. Yeah, rook f5, exactly, nice job. And if they take it, queen of mate, and that's what happened in the game. So this was a pretty cool finish. And this is a very like non-standard uh, game by modern, modern standards. Um, back then this was kind of typical, people exploring and trying different things, and some successes, some failures. Um, so Bishop d4 is basically like saying bishop a1 is unsafe and I don't want to do it. There are some other games, I think I've even shown some games here where people take on a1 and Greco checkmates them. But bishop d4 was a pretty reasonable attempt at a defense, you know, we had to do some calculation to find the way. But white was better throughout after this knight c3 move. So if you're preparing openings for like around the 1500 level, just don't forget that if you play this line, knight c3 is a mistake. Alright, here's a short game. This one I, I put in for the lulls because, like, who plays this? This is called like Damiano defense or something. They should just call it stupid. Like, it makes no sense. I love when people play this so I can sacrifice a knight on e5. So, this is something to know by heart. After knight e5, um, they have to play queen e7, and this is like the real Damiano defense. Um, black is just slightly worse here. After, for example, I think knight f3 is the best move. They get their material back, but that's all they get back. They don't get back all their wasted time and their bad pawn structure. Like, I'm gonna play knight c3 probably. So, so they, the most challenging move is pawn takes e5, but this is also a blunder. And apparently Greco also knew this. Greco knew a lot of stuff that's relevant for people who are rated around like 1500 and below these days. Um, I would say if your rating is like 800 or, or even 600, like this is very useful stuff to figure out. Queen h5 check, this is just a refutation. Like we, we play the check, and the reason they play king e7 is that if they play g6, there's a double attack. It's queen e5. That's a rook. So they play this king e7 move. It looks very awkward, but, you know, in a bullet game, black could even, like, th uh, thwart white, because if you know all the best moves for black, there's one moment that's tricky for white. That's what we're going to focus on. There's nothing tricky about developing your bishop with check. Um, okay, so actually in this game, they didn't play the good defense. So... The best defense is d5. 
and we'll, we'll take a look at that in a second. Let's first look at what Greco did. So after King g6, um, the finale of the game was with Queen f5, King h6, and this is a moment that you should not forget. Whenever you see the king out here on h6, d4 is like what we want to do. We're getting the bishop involved. Now after g5, it looks like they might hang on because they can run back. But after h4, king g7, uh, there's a precise sequence to win the game. So see if you guys can, can spot that. Yeah, there is force mate here, absolutely. There's a the best defense in the other line where they play d5, but here it's just over. Anyone want to post the mate? Uter Master called the mate, but hasn't told me what it is. I mean, I believe you, but I want you to... Alright, very good. So it's queen f7, king h6, and pawn takes g5. Double check, check me. So that's a really nice finish. So you might be wondering, like, where did black go wrong besides like sitting down to play f6 on move 2? Um, they could have improved their play with d5. Sorry. d5. And after bishop d5 check, you might be wondering, like, why is this better? You're just losing a pawn, but you're also getting this bishop to come to the defense. So after normal moves like king g6, um, play can proceed with h4. Idea is to play h5. Um, for example, if they play knight d7, I mean, knight d7 is terrible for other reasons, but like if you play h5 and then d4, it lights out. It, it's like the same kind of deal. You can check that out yourself. Um, so, <clears throat> so often people are going to play like h5 here. And this is where, um, I think this is the position where white has to find a tricky move. Because if you play something kind of uh, lackluster, normal, like, let's say you play queen g3. I think a lot of people have played queen g3 against me in training games. I, I sometimes take the black side of this, just to help people learn. After king h7, like, black's position is unpleasant, but it's not indefensible. You can definitely, like, keep fighting here. But white has a knockout blow. So see if you guys can find the, the winning move here. For white. I hope I'm not talking out of my hat. I haven't looked at this in a long time. It's not the kind of move you would expect. Like in a bullet game, probably white is not going to find this move. They're going to have a hard time checkmating your king. They're going to play queen g3 and just like make lots of moves. Okay, now if I'm not mistaken, the winning move is bishop takes b7. d4 was a good guess. Um, I think after d4, though, they are going to play like... knight f6. Maybe queen f6. The reason it's bishop b7 is that if they take the bishop, you can play queen f5, and it's the same as the Greco game. So it's good to know these other things, because it helps you. After king h6, then we play d4, and then it's going to be lights out, because you can play bishop g5. So not the same as the Greco game, but it's the same idea. Um, and if they don't take it, clearly they're going down a rook. So the evaluation of this line, starting from f6, is that white is going to win. Basically, like, a rook or an exchange. So playing f6 is a blunder. This is not even, like, debatable. This is the refutation. And Greco played a line which is, like, a respectable uh, winning line. It's just that... Um, Black didn't defend the best with d5. They played an inferior thing, and Greco still played the best moves to beat this attempt. This is a nice game. Um, of course, that's not exactly like Italian per se, but you know we're looking at Greco's games. He's the Italian Meister. So here's d6. This is not really here or there either. Um, not the Italian. Philidor defense. Um, 
And my favorite way to play against this is with d4. Although there are many fun ways to play against it, even with like g3, which is kind of lame. But um, Greco stuck with his Italian setup very, very frequently. Bishop c4 is not a bad move either. Um, after bishop g4, h3, bishop h5, c3, he's still going for the same kind of Italian plan. And I think that the opening is not really like super admirable here, um, especially considering black's play. But I do want to point out a typical middle game idea. So here comes d3. This is kind of similar to the modern setups that people play, but the bishop's inside the pawn chain. So here, here's this typical idea. So he plays g4, and then his next move will highlight why we play g4 here. It's kind of atypical, because in all the games we've seen so far, I think Greco castled kingside, and he never disturbed the kingside. So why would he play g4? What do you guys think his next move could be? Why would anyone play this ludicrous g4 move? There must be something great behind it. So the idea is to play knight h4. And this might kind of strike you as uh, not okay initially. Yeah, it's also a kingside attack. If we play g5, which is an interesting suggestion from, from Shai, um, this allows knight h5 and then knight f4, which will actually kind of resemble one of White's ideas with knight h4. If you play knight h4, not, not only could you take this bishop, you could also play knight f5. So these are all kind of the makings of a kingside attack, a big space advantage and a, a peace presence near the king. We don't want to block it up too much. We still want to be able to crack it open with, with a pawn lever, like pushing this h-pawn. So knight h4 is a good idea, but it, it might strike one as um, dangerous because whenever the knight goes on the edge, it's in line with one of these diagonal moving pieces. So you would probably have to analyze knight e4 and knight g4. But it turns out they're not a big deal. Like for example, knight e4. This is probably the most ambitious because, um, actually no, I'm sorry, Let, let's look at knight g4. Knight e4 is kind of simple. So after knight takes g4, if we just play the move pawn takes g4, then there's bishop takes h4. So we just lose a pawn. Um, but you, you can see that, um, Queen takes g4 doesn't work either because we still lose this knight, so still losing a pawn. So what gives? The the answer is that when when they create their counter threat, we create a counter counter threat. So we're taking this, and we don't care what they're doing because um, if they take back, we can take the knight, right? We're just I'd probably take with the h pawn. We're winning. Um, we're just up a piece. And if they take on e3, trying to be fancy, like ooh, I'm attacking your queen, look out then I'm actually wondering if we have anything better than this all of a sudden. But we could at least take their bishop and then take their knight. And now we're still up a piece. Like, they can check us, but this is not like a vicious Greco-style attack. We're just walking away because these guys are all sleeping. All right, so question from Master was h takes g5, bishop takes h5. What about g5? Hold on, I'm not sure if the notation was accurate there. Yeah, I'm not, all right, so you're saying never mind. I'm also not sure what that variation was, so I'm sorry. But if your question comes back, just let me know. So, um, yeah, so knight h4 does not have a tactical reputation, but you do have to look out for these kinds of things. Sometimes it does. So they played c6, maybe trying to play d5, like in Greco style, but kind of slow. Greco liked to play d5 all in one move. So after c6, uh, there's knight takes, pawn takes, and now we get to go ahead with maybe something similar to, um, oh, by the way, dp64, I just noticed your comment. Yeah, that was absolutely right. It was knight h4. Um, yeah, so maybe we could go ahead now with the king side attack that everyone was mentioning. Greco played h4, and the idea is just to open the file. This is kind of a rare instance of Greco not castling. He almost always castles. Um, so black played b5. Bishop b3 is an obvious move. We played a5. And here, I think it might be partly a matter of taste what you do next. But I know that Greco really wants this bishop to stay on b3. So let, let's suppose that you're Greco, you really want your bishop to stay on b3, 
because you like that. It's a good attacking piece. What would you play here? A5 is kind of threatening A4, so how do we deal with that scenario? So DP64 is saying we just play H5 anyway. That, that's kind of a, a good suggestion. Um, but what if, all right, I have two ideas here. We're gonna have to take a look at both of them. So what if they take this first? I think that if you play pawn takes, the H file is blocked for now and then they can get an A4. But probably if you were suggesting h5, you wanted to play g5. Which has the uh, the idea that um, if I move the knight somewhere kind of lame, like let's pretend I played knight e8, this is going to be crushing. So that's a nice idea. Um, but I think they'll play, <coughs> I think they'll play this move. And maybe this is even like still, still good for white. I'm not that sure though, because they're threatening bishop g5 with the idea of coming back and guarding the h-file, and you can't force this knight to move so you get queen h5, and if you play rook h5, then your coordination is a little bit messed up, like you have to take back here, and then I think bishop g5 is just in time. So I think pawn h5 maybe doesn't work for that reason, just my, my first feeling. Um, I, I also think that if they just play a4, you might have some issues as well. I don't know, maybe this is like just a daring attack. Let's let's just check this. So let's say they take. This would be in Greco style, so we have to check it out. And maybe instead of like caring about this pawn on g6, we just play g5. We just really want this. This might, this just might be winning for white. I don't know what they can play here. They're up a, they're up a piece, so they could like try, but we're just threatening to take and play queen h5. Yeah, I think maybe, um, maybe a4 doesn't work. They have to take here first. But you know, h5 is a good try. So a4 is kind of a simple no-brainer way of stopping them from playing a4. Um, it has downsides, but not not that much. So a4 is just stopping them from playing a4 themselves. In the game they played b4, I think this is like really bad. <clears throat> and this allowed h5 with all the ideas that we just talked about. Takes g5, big attack. See, Greco is like really not that bad of a player. These are some attacking ideas that are still powerful today that we can we can all use. Um, now, he, after rook takes h5, knight takes e3, he played this intermediate move. Um, there's a, I think there's a difference in this position compared to the one we were analyzing, in that um, after king takes h8, queen h5, g6, the bishop is not... Actually, maybe this also works in the other line. Let, let's actually check that out. Um, basically, the, the, the pawn is pinned, so queen h7 is, is, is happening. And that's how the game ended. Let's go back to this line that we were checking out with h5. Let's see, if they play a4, oh no, sorry, it was this line, because we were concerned about what happens here. Yeah, maybe I was too hasty, rook h8 is a really nice move. Yeah, actually, so, I wonder if h5 does just work, like, maybe Greco skipped a move unnecessarily. some caveat here. Sorry, I'm clouded. Hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe h5 right away does work. So we have to look for another move. Not this. Maybe a4 was superfluous. It's kind of, it's, it is kind of a no-brainer move, but it might not have been necessary. So maybe d5 is better.
Yeah, B4 was hideous. So even in the main line, when they played B4, they should have played D5 here. Maybe they were worried to sack a pawn. Actually, yeah, maybe A4 is like slightly more precise. I'm not sure. The, the way in which A4 seems kind of appealing is that if they play D5, Greco could switch gears and play like this. To snag this extra pawn. That's kind of interesting, the difference between these lines. But anyway, Greco used this cool attacking idea. That was the main thing I wanted to show. Okay, so here's the next game. This one's really short, nine moves. Truly in the Italian game this time. Um, Greco actually did something uh, not very good. Knight g5. Um, sometimes Greco did really weird stuff. Even Morphe did weird stuff when he was the best, like 200 years later. There are some just really strange games where, like, they've clearly demonstrated that they understand that the move they're playing is bad, but they still do it anyway. Uh, but this game it worked out, so let's just see what happened. <coughs> Here's another tactical idea. So if they take the knight, knight h7 is a blunder. Anybody know why? Thanks for tuning in, Shy. Take care. Yeah, so after knight, knight h7, uh, Yuter Master is calling it by name. After knight h7, queen h5, black resigns. That's what happened. But if black played a different move, <coughs> like for example, trying to make sure. Maybe maybe there's really no good move after hxg5. I mean, they don't have to take on g5. I was trying to see if they could survive by playing like d6, but even here it looks pretty miserable because when you take back, queen h5 is still coming. Um, you get a little bit of counterplay with queen f2, but after king d1, I think it's just not really coming together. Okay, so the moral of the story here is like Greco tried this weird, weird idea, and I think he was just kind of depending on his opponents not being as strong as he was. So after h4, um, they took it. That was bad. They should play like d6. Okay, let's see. What else do I have here? Okay, so here's another main line. Um, people will often play um, bishop d2. Modern grandmasters are mostly playing d3 in this position, so we don't really see this from like Carlson, for example, who plays d3 a lot. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and the reason is that in this line, it's basically like there's a forced repetition. If black takes, takes, and then finds one good move, they're at least equal. So what should black play here? Let's see what, if you guys know your opening theory. It's also just a very reasonable move. Even without opening theory, you can probably guess this move. Yep, it's d5. So d5 is, is usually an equalizing move in like pretty much every opening. Um, so after, if you can get it in, if you can get like e5 and d5, you're almost always like in the clear. So after pawn takes d5, knight takes d5, it's just equal. Usually, um, white will force a draw with queen b3. And the way that this becomes a repetition, and the reason that grandmasters don't play is because they don't want a repetition, is they'll play knight a5, queen a4, knight c6, queen b3. Every time they go to b3, they're threatening to take this knight. And every time they play knight a5, they're preventing the taking of the knight. And every time they, oh, sorry, every time they play um, queen a4, the knight just goes back, and the only way to renew a threat is with queen b3. So, that's how the grandmaster draw would happen. And this is not challenging at all. You know, people are, the gr grandmasters are constantly trying to find, um, either new ways of applying their old ideas, or, uh, new ideas that they can use to surprise their opponents and keep the game alive. In this position, there, there are really not any compelling ideas. So this is why, um, top level chess has sort of departed away from the Greco Gambit and this Bishop D2 line. People are just not playing it because it's not that challenging. It leads to a drop pretty quickly. 
So, in this game, they played knight takes e4. And I think this is a really interesting line, even though um, it's widely regarded as a mistake to play knight takes e4. In fact, for a while I taught that knight takes e4 was a mistake. I think it's more interesting than that. It's still not my choice, but it's not like a blunder. Um, there's a combination here by which white wins a pawn. So, probably, um, if, if you're watching the replay, you can look for it. It takes a couple moves. It's all forced. So you have to look for checks and captures here. It starts with bishop takes b4. And then this typical sacrifice. For a double attack. This is super common. Yeah, Eatermaster got it. Nice. So queen b3. Now, the party line here is that this position is better for white because black has lost their castle. And white's pieces are active. But it has commonly been said, if I remember correctly, that you have to play knight e5 to have an edge here. Because if you play queen takes b4 just like that, I think this gives black a tempo for rook e8. If I remember correctly. This might not be totally accurate, but... I, I do remember that people frequently will say that you have to throw a knight e5 first. And in this game they play king g8, hopelessly passive, very sad, way away. But um, in this position, after looking at this like a hundred times, I found a move for black that is actually kind of interesting. It's weird that there's any interesting move for black here. Even weirder is that the move is king e6. White's next move is forced, they have to take this. And now here, black is a way of like killing white's play on the spot. Queen f8. So, I would say they have compensation, because after queen takes f8, the reason this is forced, and they're not playing, for example, like, I don't know, queen b3, is that this move's very good. We don't want that. So they have to take, but this gives a tempo to attack f2. And I think that it's not very comfortable for white to do, for example, castling, because of moves like c5. This knight's unstable. Black is well prepared for the end game because their king is centralized. So this is a really interesting idea. Don't tell your friends. Just try to beat them. Um, after king g8, though, which is what happened in Greco's game like 420 years ago. It wasn't really 420 years ago. That's when he was born. But you know, it sounds it sounds good. Um, after queen takes b4, white's position is just dominating. Um, maybe they could go for that same resource here. But I, I really do prefer white because here they would have to take with the king, not the rook. It's a difference. Yeah, king op. So they play queen f6, which has like the, the right idea, but wrong application. Greco castle. They played c5, trying to undermine this knight. But but their king is in just such a, a bad position. Here, um, it's white to play. Let's see if you guys can figure out how to um, generate some, some play for, for white against c5. Okay, so the, the move that Greco chose was queen b5. This is pretty pretty strong, just getting it on the back rank. They played b6. Um, I guess they wanted to move the bishop but not lose the b-pawn. But probably they should just sack the b-pawn. You know, they're going to get this d-pawn anyway. This allowed queen e8, queen f8, queen c6, hitting the rook. Very important. Also hitting the d-pawn. They saved the rook indirectly, but lost the game. So, interesting finale. I've got a couple other games here. Um, let me just do like a quick flyover. I think I have to have to cut out, but I, I don't want to go without showing you guys some of these things. Yeah, this is an example where black plays um, a retreating move and allows e5. Greco won this in 14 moves. Snowplow, as they call it on Chess Kid. Pawns go bird. Okay. 
Of course, you can go through this more slowly on the replay if you're curious about any of the moves. And I, I do respond to all comments. I just wanted to show you guys, this is what happens when you back up. You have to play bishop b4 here to avoid the snowplow issue. And Greco laid the groundwork for all these things that people, you know, now put on the internet to help people start out playing chess. Greco was the OG, like, the beefiest beginner of all time. The beginner of beginners, maybe you could call him. Because chess was kind of young back then. We've already seen this, so I'm going to skip that. This is another Greco Gambit. And this one's actually more interesting. Um, I want to point out that Greco actually played the modern best continuation for several moves here. After bishop takes c3, white's next move is quite counterintuitive. Um, if you want to just guess the move, for um, curiosity's sake, feel free to pause this if you're watching the replay. Um, but the move that he played was d5, which is kind of crazy. Usually you don't think of like sacking a pawn, and then sacking a whole knight, and then making a pawn move. Like, usually you would take back and then go for some kind of compensation. The reason we don't take back is not that we're worried about knight c3. This is a blunder. Queen e wants a double attack. We don't king's blush it, right? We don't want to lose a piece. So what black will do here is play d5. And this is slightly better for, for black because this knight's very strong, this pawn's kind of weak, um, and black can safely castle. So, so that's the motivation for not taking the bishop and like looking for this weird move to begin with. Now here you can see there are kind of three pieces hanging. This one's under attack, this one's under attack, and this one's about to be under attack. So that's the issue. In this game, they play knight e5, which is not really a, a good move. Um, the theoretical best move is bishop f6. I was not able to find any games where Greco's opponent chose this move. I wonder what he would have played. Maybe he would have played the, the modern best move. Anyway, knight e5, bc3, knight c4. This is another way to reach this position, and the refutation is kind of interesting. So I'll just show you guys, and then we'll sign off for today. Queen d4 is a double attack, but they have a double defense. Bring the knight back. But this doesn't protect g7. So now they have to make some decisions. Queen f6 was uh, not a very good choice, but it's a very logical choice. Basically, you're, you're up and you want to trade pieces. So there's also a critical line with rook f8. You guys could check that out on your own time. Um, bishop h6, but you know queen f6 is more challenging. And counterintuitively, we're not going to retreat the queen and um, try to play for compensation. We trade queens. And then it turns out that um, black's pieces are just so badly coordinated that they can't endure the attack with the rooks and minor pieces. So king d8 is basically necessary. If they go here, then we throw a check. And I think rook e5 is winning. That looks right to me. Now, if they play a knight to e4, for instance, then they're probably going to lose on the spot to this attack of the defender, right? The knight is supporting this knight, the knight's under attack, they can't support these pieces, blah, blah, they're going to lose one. Um, hold on, is there a issue here? What if they get out of the pit? Yeah, actually, maybe they could get out of the pit, so let's not be hasty here. I seem to recollect knight d4. The idea is that um, if they play like king f8, we play f3, they have to go somewhere. We throw a check, we could have thrown this check first too. And then I think the same tactical idea. So this is all kind of cool. Not, not bishop g5. So this is why they chose king d8, I guess, but it's not really inspiring. Bishop g5, knight d8's kind of pathetic. Um, and here he went for another remove the defender, right? So this knight's pinned. This is guarded by the king and the rook. This defends the, the knight, so he's sacrificing. He could have gotten the rook as well, because the king would be trapped. So that's why they took with the king. Rook e1, king f8. And now it's that same kind of problem that we encountered before, rook e5. And black resigned. There's just nothing to do. Even even knight e4 doesn't delay it. Like, we can just take it and we're going here. 
Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. If they play knight e4 to try to delay, we have a different checkmate, this one. Yeah, so this was kind of cool. Really interesting final game. And a lot of the, the modern theory in the Greco Gambit is, is basically the same as it was 400 years ago. Um, but, you know, people play bishop f6 now. And um, people play rook e1. This is, I think this is the main line. Um, although, honestly, I, I forget a lot of things lately. I think that you have to start with knight e7. I remember there's a nuance, like if you play d6 or knight e7 first, it's a, there's a problem. I think maybe you start with d6 and allow this check, and then play knight e7. And an idea that I like, I don't know if this is the main line, but I like to play g4. And if they castle here, they lose a piece. Love it. Um, so, so they might play h6. But then this destabilizes their long-term castling prospects because, like, I renew the threat of trapping their bishop. They still can't castle. They have to make some desperate moves to survive. And I think engine assessment of the Greco gambit is that it's slightly better for black with very accurate play. So that could be another reason that grandmasters have kind of moved away from these lines. But they're still quite viable at a lower level. So I hope you guys will enjoy playing them. And, um, yeah, so I, th I think that's all I've got for today. And um, I hope you guys have fun with this, and that I'll see you next time. All right. Take care, everyone.